Welcome to Herring Gut Learning Center. I'm Tom Mullen, the Executive Director of the Center, and we've been around for nearly 25 years, and this past summer, on August 9th, 2021, at the Oceanside Grange, we hosted a really amazing program about the history of Port Klein, gathering community members, representatives of the fishing community, the business community, and the arts community to share stories of how Port Clyde and the region along the St. George Peninsula has evolved over the last hundred plus years. We're very pleased to share this video of the presentation that night and hope that you might be able to stop by sometime at the center's 59 Factory Lane in Port Clyde. But as a 501c3 nonprofit, we do depend upon the support of visitors and folks like yourself who might be able to help us continue our programming and outreach to the greater Midcoast area. Thanks for your support and enjoy the video.
And in addition to that, uh, the staff I work with, uh, Karen Gutt and uh, Sally Kusayan and uh, Patrick Burnham, have done an outstanding job in supporting this team of people to produce our evening today. But to give you a little, you know, a little bit of slot, uh, talk about our this main host tonight, we have uh, the co-chair of our um, board of trustees, Philip Conklin. Uh, we'll give a short brief. You said four or five hours. This is Mary Got Center. Well, uh, I was working at the Island Institute in 1993. I got a call from Phyllis Wyatt, who, uh, Jamie Wyatt's wife, who was coming to Maine uh, as, uh, after running a very successful horse farm in Wilmington, she wanted to bring some of her interest in farming to mid-coast Maine, to you know, the Port Clyde region. And she asked, uh, the Island Institute to help her start an oyster farm. The, uh, and that, that was complicated, uh, but we introduced uh, Phyllis to uh, oyster uh, farmers and, and people who were running nurseries, and, and Phyllis uh, started, a, uh, started an oyster farm and got so excited about it. Uh, there were some failures along the way. This is a complicated business, uh, and uh, she decided Look, really, what uh, what I can do uh, for the area is to leave a longer legacy of education, teaching uh, younger uh, yeah, younger people, particularly from fishing families, but not just from fishing families, to, um, to to understand the challenges and the opportunities uh, when traditional, lots of traditional fisheries were declining, what the opportunities were to harness some of the natural productivity of the inshore waters of the Gulf of Maine to raise a, a variety of, of, of creatures. And that became uh, the nexus of the uh, Heron Gut Learning Center, which she began building in 1998. It opened the first year in 1999 and has since become the, the most uh, successful and respected aquaculture education program for middle and high school students in the state of Maine. But we're a little hidden gem in a way. Uh, the, uh, there have been, uh, it, so kind of every year for 10 or 15 years, the students that went through the program at Herring Gut, which has you know state-of-the-art facilities, were uh, primarily from the St. George School or from the from the Rockland Thomaston schools. It uh, and, and when I uh, stepped down from the Island Institute, uh, Phyllis asked me to join the board of Herring Gut, and I I said then and believe now the biggest challenge uh, for Herring Gut is to uh, make sure that a larger number of people know what incredible opportunities exist for young people. In, you know, to transform these inshore waters into, at least in part, not just uh, traditional fishing opportunities, but that in combination with, um, with raising gardens in the sea. And uh, so that's what uh, Herring Gut does and uh, has been doing for over 20 years now. And I'm proud to be a part of it. And I think uh, 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 Kathy Barker, who is just stepping down after three years of leading the organization, turning it over to Tom. We have a great team, and uh, I hope you'll stay tuned and uh, thank Lori Beth and her team for this evening. As an example of some of the programs that we do at Herring Gut before we launch into our program, on each of the chairs is a program brochure that outlines some of the programs we're going to be doing this summer and reach out to yeah. year round as well as some of the residents of the mm -hmm. St. George Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Lots of programs and, and again if you're still in the area and like to visit or have grandchildren or children that like to come by, we'll also open Monday through Friday you can pop in and take a look at the aqua aquaponic uh, facility that we have here. Special free, uh, the Quarry Tab is offering this Thursday through Monday a special entree featuring the aquaponic uh, 
produce from uh, Jerry Gut as part of their menu, and the proceeds of the uh, sales of their meals will go to Jerry Gut. So stop by and have a nice meal and support us in, in America. With that said, this, as Laurie Beth mentioned, this is the beginning of a conversation that we have, and some programming ideas that we have planned for the coming year. And this window into the stories and the, uh, and the history of the people that made uh, Fort Clyde is what we're opening the door for our future programs. Uh, with us uh, today, first off, is Jerry Cushman. He's representing the Cushman family, who, uh, as many of you all know, have uh, been around the peninsula for literally decades. And, uh, represent and have been a long time advocate for lobstering and fishing in the uh, St. George area. So, Terry, do you mind stepping up? And, oh, I have a couple of leading questions, or perhaps a few folks might have some questions from the well, audience. I'm going to introduce myself real quick. I'm Jerry Cushman. I uh, lived here my whole life. Uh, I spent a little brief time in Port Um I'm named after two people in Port Clyde. I'm uh, named after, uh, Ger my real name is Gerald, B uh, Gerald Cushman. I'm named after Gerald Bina, who came here in Bar Harbor's Island in the 1920s and became like a father figure to my father. And then I'm named after, my middle name is Robert, and I'm named after Walter Anderson's brother, uh, Robert Anderson. And everybody probably knows Walter more than Robert Anderson. Walter was the icon. Uh, Picture guy for Andrew Wyatt. Um, Andrew and, and Walter spent many, many days and walks together. Bill Thorne would often join him. I have a dock down there by uh, the Cold Storage, and I, as a child, I can constantly remember uh, Walt Hopper, I mean, uh, Bill Thorne, Andrew Wyatt, and yes, and Walt Anderson uh, walking down. And uh, so I I'm not I'm in my 30s, and so I, you know, actually, uh, I was in my 30s, but I, I, do, I, do really, I have some great memories with, uh, with the art world in uh, Port Clyde. So, that's a little bit about myself. Um, so, oh, so, I was just curious, but as far as the fishing uh, traditions of your family, when did the Cushmans first arrive in the St. George Peninsula? And I think you mentioned they were somewhere else first. Yeah, so my family actually came over, I'm the, the 10%. My family came over on the Mayflower. Um, and so, but they originally, they, origin, they migrated uh, north, northeast, and uh, kind of found themselves in Friendship, Long Island, Bremen, Long Island, and then came to Port Clyde about 90 years ago. Um, but my fit, my just a little bit of history about my family. They don't like to stop at one or two kids. They like to have eight and nine. So um, thank God we broke that tradition. <laughs> uh, so there was a big branch of Trishmans. Uh, some stayed in Friendship, uh, Long Island, but my grandfather uh, Shannon and Esther Cushman came to Port Clyde and. The, my grandfather had seven kids, um, in which alone were two boys and, and six girls, uh, five girls. So your dad, your dad was a uh, fisherman? My dad was a fisherman, my grandfather was a fisherman. Uh, to be honest with you, fishing, since we came over here on the Mayflower, whether you believe this or not, my great-grandfather, the original guy that came over on the Mayflower, made a speech, he fished in Europe. And made a speech how he would fish for cod in, in uh, Plymouth and how he would feed many, many people. And I'm trying to get my hands on his speech, but why I know this is because my grandmother, who's 98, Eber, uh, is doing a gene genealogy and she was just briefly telling me about it. So I can't wait to get my hands on it. Yeah, that's great. I just want to also quickly thank Eva, the shout out to Eva and to Aunt Deborah because they spent a lot of time with the planning committee. Uh, talking about this evening, and we're trying to make it go to the whole reasons for that. Yeah. So, by, 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 to answer your question, my family's been here about 90 years. Uh, to be honest with you, the Hoppers have long, long longevity. Uh, probably, you know, Ford's, uh, Ford, I remember Ford and the Anderson family. There's a lot of families that have been here for a lot longer. And, and, uh, so, uh, so if, if the family's been, uh, and then I'll open up to anybody else's particular question. So, 
If the family's been lobstering and fishing, and I assume you might have had a combination of lobstering and fishing, or is it been mostly one or the other? Uh, no, uh, that's the one thing I missed about fishing. Um, and why I started this group, Maine Coast Fishers Association. Um, there was more diverse fishing. Right now, we're pretty much stuck in lobster. Everybody in this room is pretty much understands lobster, and that's it. But long ago, lobstering was actually just a <coughs> summer, early fall fishery. We would go into scalloping. We had mixed, you know, Dougie Anderson's here. He was a big scallop fisherman. Everybody would try to follow him all around. Uh, then we'd go into shrimping. And shrimping, it was my favorite fishery. Um, and Port Clyde, you know, brought in a lot of shrimp. And there's nothing like taking it. Uh, Coffee, you know, coffee table or a table, and steaming up some fresh main shrimp, tipping it over, and having some little dishes of butter and cocktail sauce to dip into, and just have some cocktails and tell some lies, you know. <laughs> and, so, and then from there, um, we, you know, a lot of the, everybody went into ground fishing into June, and July. We had the migration of dads, cod, uh, gray sole. Gray sole was great June month. It fit, and prices were really well. I mean, there were a lot of processing places in which you're going to hear about up and down the coast of Maine. Not just sardine factories, but, you know, fish, cutting fishing houses that, you know, provided food for a lot of New York and all around the world. Right, in fact, that was one of the things is a lot of uh, fresh catch was lobsters as well as other um, fish were shipped, packed in ice, and put on ships and sent right down to Boston and, and New York. Yeah, so I do have a, I work for story. I have a brother who's still ground fishing, and he, I'll tell you how bad ground fishing is compared to, he's getting prices that today, that they received in the 1970s. That's a challenge. And I am in the lobstering industry and I'm receiving prices that are, that are phenomenal. I'm gonna be honest with you today. But to be honest with you, the lobstering industry deserves it. They went through some, you know, when we had the crash, and you know, when we saw prices at two dollars, it was really hard to make a living on two dollar lobster price. Just to even operate the boat. Yeah. So, and you know, with uh, Harry Gut, they're always, you know, talking about, you know, the gardens and aquaculture and things like that. I would like to hear see Harry Gut or a school. I'm worried that fish are going to come back, shrimp are going to come back. But the knowledge on how to harvest these are going to be gone. And with my brother leaving and me leaving and Dougie Hilsing leaving, I don't know who's going to teach these guys how to how to keep that history going. Right. And keep the industry and the jobs available for that area. Yes, sir. Does anybody have any particular questions for Derek? Yeah, so I just have one last one. In the time that you've been lobstering, has there been any, like, you know, new technology that has really helped you be a safer lobster. Safer, yeah. Well, I mean, we, you know, we have definitely have better safety equipment. Uh, it still can be upgraded. I mean, last year we lost nine fishermen. Yeah. Um, so um, it can always be upgraded, and and and. But technology is great, but remember, with technology, it makes us better fishermen. A better fisherman makes a better fish stock disappear. Yeah. Um, that's the, the that's the downfall of it. And you know, Larry worked with Ray Don, and uh, he's to blame for all the <laughs> stocks <laughs> disappear. <laughs> so, with that, no questions. Perfect. Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you. Most of you all know, up until 1970, there was a uh, sardine packing factory right here in Port Clyde. Uh, you don't hear about what happened to it in our presentation, but uh, Rick Rockwell. Oh, and uh, I, Rick has got a uh, relatively five, six hour long slideshow. <laughs> but I am actually your, uh, your clicker. So let me uh, find the slideshow real quick. So, uh, I'm supposed to speak about memories, and uh, I started as a really little guy with really big memories. 
because everything that was part of the sardine industry was dynamic and fragrant and colorful. Uh, so if I can, just the very first, we'll try this click. <laughs> click. <laughs> uh, hang on one second, I'll get out of the... Uh... So, those of you that are around my age, uh, drove up to Maine, the sardine season is roughly through the summer and into the very early parts of fall. So we would have an annual migration to the factory and to what the season was going to, was going to uh, provide for us. And as we would come across the 495 was built, at the Wiscasset Bridge in Route 1 was this giant fisherman. Oh, uh, that was, that was, uh, uh, it was a iconic introduction to me and to the sardine industry, which at the time had well over 100 canneries along the coast of Maine. This is the 50s into the early 60s. Uh, this sign uh, ultimately was reinstalled up in at Stinson's plant up in Prospect Harbor, Maine. Is it Prospect Harbor? Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, and uh, he was able to somehow claim that. Nobody thought it was valuable. But that was a product of the Maine sardine industry. And the Maine sardine industry felt it best to work as a group, to market as a group, to work as a group. Go to the next page. The history of our family's presence in Port Clyde really goes back to Brooklyn, New York in the 20s. There's a company called Delta Fish. Delta Fish was all sorts of appetizers, herring. Sardines are herring. What's put into a can are called sardines. But herring was really what was happening in the 20s and in the 30s. It was considered to be like the fast food of the time. There was no McDonald's, but this was a food that you could take out of the can or out of the jar, which was revolutionary, the jar, because they used to wrap it in paper and get a herring filet and it wrapped in paper. And these guys came up with the brilliant idea of putting it in jars, and we had the very first convenient food, and it boomed with the uh, growth of immigrants, Europeans that all came here after World War I, it became very much a uh, part and parcel with the uh, immigrants' diets. And it was a booming industry from the 20s, from the after World War I, really up until about the mid 60s. It was when that uh, the herring industry uh, really took uh, root. So back in Brooklyn, no surprise, uh, imported herring. Where do you get your fish from? They're not, they're not, they're not catching fish in Brooklyn. Uh, they're buying fish, and they're buying imported fish, purportedly from uh, the European, Scandinavian countries, but in reality, it was mostly Canadian fish. And it was controlled. The fish was controlled. Let's go through. This is a, this is a Delta fish, Brooklyn. This is a first delivery truck. Uh, Delta Fish was selling to restaurants and to hotels, not really to the retail trade. Let's keep going again. And this picture is from Damerscotta Mills, which is the place that my family uh, first found themselves sourcing uh, a main herring and processing it. That was Damerscotta Mills. Uh, my grandfather was buying fish from a very few sellers, uh, and as such, that was not exactly an arm's length market. He was very, very frustrated by it, and nobody could ever get enough fish. And he had the idea that if he would uh, leave New York and come up to Maine, he'd be able to get closer to the source of fish. And in fact, he couldn't have come up with a better idea because in Damerscotta Mills, there was a stream full of freshwater alewives, and he had the fish swim right to the factory. It was very, very, <laughs> 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 very innovative. Uh, so this is 
women that were packing, there's a Damascot factory, we built through another. That's Damascot factory, we built through another one, and the Damascot factory, which of course uh, became not very practical once that source of fish was depleted, uh, which forced him, we'll go to another, which forced him then to find a place in which he'd be able to acquire fish from the ocean. Uh, at the time, the world was in a herring straddle, so to speak. There were stop wains, stop weirs, I should say, and these were fixed uh, weirs where fish would swim in, not unlike a lobster trap, and would not be able to get out. And that was very much the practice up into the 30s and into the 40s, and as we get into the 50s, uh, that method becomes less efficient, uh, and the um, they, they had to go and start to chase fish out in the open ocean, which is called pursing. So it's, uh, this is the factory in Port Clyde. It was a boat, it was a boat, a lobster, a clam processing facility, a boat shop. Uh, my grandfather bought it, Port Clyde Packing, with a guy by the name of Upham, Shirley, Sherwood Upham? Uh, Sherwood. Sherwood Upham. Uh, and they had this facility for Heron, for Heron. Where was that? This is where the factory is, at the top of Factory Road, where the road comes up and it turns. This is uh, where uh, Cal, 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 Cal Danielson's Cal house was the general manager's house for the factory. Didn't have a porch on it, didn't have the extension. That square footprint of the primary house was green, and it was the, the, the plant manager's house. I think it's really interesting that that was probably the, least, the most least desirable property in all of Port Clyde. <laughs> Jerry's mother lives not too far away, and through grandmother. the grandmother, I'm sorry, and through the destruction of the factory and the inclusion of so many people in this room, uh, Jerry's grandmother's house can now be purchased for a million dollars. Proceeds go to Jerry. <laughs> So this is, this is my grandfather, it's interesting, I was going through an old deposition and it was a story about my grandfather coming up in the winter of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 40s. And this is a picture of him uh, in, the, in the late 40s when he acquired uh, the, this, this building which ultimately became the factory. Uh, and you know, being in Maine during the winter is a story in and of itself, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I, was, I was very excited to, 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 to see, and I believe that this is around the time that he acquired that building initially. As you see, the, 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 the building starts to grow as activity, uh, you know, uh, increases in the building, and you start to see how uh, the waste can be removed from the building, how new fish can be brought into the building. Uh, this is now later on. As the building was expanded, um, a point of change. A story that not many people know about the building and about Port Clyde Packing. So it was Delta Fish. And Delta Fish had a number of partners and a number of financial partners who never left New York. And they controlled the brands, the recipes, and probably a lot of the distribution. My grandfather was an independent guy, believed in America, believed in free enterprise, uh, and was a nonconformist. I don't know where I get it from. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he rebelled against all these things, and the powers that be were going to teach him who's in control. And there was a multi-year fight between <laughs> stakeholders. Uh, interestingly, the financial folks that were, the name was Ortenberg, uh, were in control, recognized my grandfather as, as kind of a working stiff, who was out there with three, with four children, 
uh, and they came to the they came to a, a pro, uh, to a, uh, an agreed upon manner in which they would resolve their differences, and that entailed their showing up on a day certain with as much cash as they can get, and taking the assets of the company, which were physical assets and intellectual assets, and auctioning them off, whoever, whoever would show up with the most amount of money, and then at the end of the auction, just take the money and split it between the parties. And that's how they chose to resolve. He, he meaning the folks that had the dollars, pushed the process three years with the thought that they would give themselves an advantage because they had capital and my grandfather didn't. And I just last night read the deposition where he ran around to every relative and every friend and everybody he knew, including folks who he picked up of them, uh, and aggregated as much capital as he possibly could and showed up at the auction to the shock of the other partners and able to bid. And he went in with no plan other than with the cash. So there were three companies that were uh, the subject of this bidding process. The Port Clyde Packing, or, port, or the activities that were happening out of this building. There was Delta Fish down in Brooklyn, which was distributing all the fish. And there was a salmon company up in, up in, up in Canada called the Independent Salmon Company. So my grandfather, faced with a strategic decision as to whether or not he should, what should he buy with the money he had, came to a quick realization that he doesn't need recipes, he doesn't need brands, he needs the tools to create food. And so he chose to put all the dollars into physical tools. And the other folks chose to put all their resources into the intellectual product. And it's a really interesting, you know, as I have grown uh, to, you know, become a semi-adult, uh, the thinking that was associated with that. Um, my grandfather, having successfully acquired the, the factory, did not acquire the recipe. He did not acquire the process. He did not acquire the brand. He came up with what's called, what here it is. It's called the, uh, the Zwecker process or the new process, or raw pack. And in 1952, 54, I'm sorry, uh, it was the second year, the new sardine process, raw pack. And it speaks to this innovation uh, or this new process that was uh, created by Sam Zwecker. I uh, can't really see him, but the, the guy that looks not unlike my cousin David. <laughs> <laughs> same guy, uh, used to say silhouette. <laughs> and, and what was involved in this new process that was considered to be somewhat revolutionary, um, somewhat revolutionary, was that he cooked initially Europe, all the factories in the United States. They would cook the fish and then put them in the can and then cook them again. And what he did is a combination of things. First thing he did is when the fish were, 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 were uh, aggregated out per se or out in weirs, they would, first they would pull that fish up with baskets, get into a really nice, nice tight net of fish, very little water, mostly fish, and they would put big baskets in and haul those baskets of fish into the holds of sardine carriers where there was salty brine. Uh, ultimately, as it evolved and became modernized and more technology got involved, they would put a giant tube right into the right into the uh, into the ball of fish and suck the fish right into the into the boat. And that was the first part of the process. The second part of the process was somewhat benign. They would leave the fish alive in those holes for 24 hours. And with the intention of, the intention of that is for the fish to pass whatever impurities they had in their bodies 
uh, which create, was an improvement in process to have clean fish be able to come out of those holes. The boats would go, would, would go to the factory, very similar uh, pipes as was used to suck the fish into the boat was used to suck the fish out of the boat and feed the factory. Feeding the factory was, as a young child, was a extraordinary thing to witness because we had large, wide conveyor belts that would come up through the floors and they would be just full of fish, mostly herring, but there were other fish in there. There, was, there were dogfish and there were mackerel and there were all sorts of species of fish and the larger fish, the small fish, would be stopped by these little, uh, I don't think, these little ridges that would be on conveyor belts that would be able to hold the fish as they go up vertically. But the big fish always would sit over the top of those and you'd see them kind of, you know, gravity kind of going over the other fish, these very, very big fish, and then there'd be people that would pick them out and they would inevitably find their way to different people's dinner tables in and around town. Let's go to uh, another picture of the factory. Uh, this is showing a um, uh, the, sort of the early stages of aggregating. They would have a dory, and the dory would go out and would be used to uh, encircle the fish and you know sort of manage the constricting of the nets in order to get into a tight ball and facilitate that catch being brought into the factory. That's, that's, a, that's a picture very familiar to my cousins and my family because this is the factory as we remembered uh, in the 60s. And it was a, a good, good, good. Now this is, um, was also part of, 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 of my childhood. It's something very, very different today. I say, you know, uh, uh, you know, a little bit uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a little bit of humor, but there's a truth that the factory created a lot of waste and noise and sound and 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 uh, and, 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 and odors, and it was considered to be not so desirable. People complained. I know where my mother or my brother-in-law and my sister live. Uh, Cottage Road, it's not a happy place, you know, staring at that factory all the time. But, you could put a drop line at the end of the factory and pull up a flounder, or pull up the most amazing fish. And so the back of the factory, you always had people with drop lines. You'd go down to the general store for a nickel, you get a drop line, you only had to do was put that line down on the bottom, and you were catching fish. And people would leave that factory all day long, with dinner. Uh, this, uh, so, and there may be my grandmother, maybe, but maybe, maybe one of those. I'm not mistaken. Maybe go through another. Again, the factory. There were two boats that were sort of the signature vessels for Port Clive packing. One was the Delta. The Delta was, yeah, how big was the Delta? 80 feet long, and the Neary, which was 67 feet. Both had a capacity of about a thousand bushels, um, and uh, the Delta I know was the pride of my grandfather because it was the fastest sergeant carrier, formerly a sub chaser uh, for the uh, during World War II, and the uh, the Neria used to always be on the harbor side. The Delta used to be on the always was parked facing out towards the lighthouse. That's my grandfather uh, when they were first built the factory. Standing there, this is one of the pictures I'm standing on. If you like to stand, I guess, around uh, plywood and construction, <laughs> plywood take pictures. Here you see uh, herring being aggregated. That's are being pulled so that it's just a tight bundle of, of fish. It's called pressing. Sorry? It's Pers called pressing. First person. There you go. Uh, I think this is the Delta. I don't know if that's Delta the Neary. Neither one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, I guess what I'm saying. Okay, so let me, get, let me get back to the packing process. So I had you fish going up these conveyor belts. They then would be, there was always a, there was a person that would sit in a catalog. The catalog had refrigerated square bins of brine. And in this walkway, each one of these tanks, as they were filled with fish that was taken from the, from the boats, the individual who was up in that catwalk was responsible for feeding the factory fish. And the way he did it, pretty low tech, is there were large pipes that were standing up, and there was a chase way, and he would take the pipe and just bring it down, and the fish would come out of the tanks, gravity driven water and would just go down these chaseways and then get fed into conveyor belts. The conveyor belts, you see some pictures of uh, the packers, went down into a large packing room with 200 people that worked in the factory, a little over 200 people that worked in the factory in the work line. And many of those people were women that were cutting fish. And the way that the women cutting fish were compensated, uh, which is, I believe now is illegal, uh, was by the trip. So there was an individual who would walk with one of these carts, and this cart was part of the Zwecker process, because these were the carts uh, and the racks, which you can see racks and carts, that carried the goods around the factory. So, the, the, way, the way it worked with Packers was that they got so much per rack, they had a little punch card that was sitting on a, on a, on a rope or on a wire, and as the person with this rack would pick up the, the racks with different Packers, he punched the, the card to indicate what their, what their how much they, uh, Cut, how many fish they cut. You'll see a little picture over there. Of course, I did have the fastest sardine pack cutter uh, for a couple of years. This was a uh, contest that used to occur each year at the lobster festival. And I think it was on Rick Griffin once. <laughs> um, and uh, that was, uh, and you see also a apron. They had a little your hat and nets, and inevitably fingers that were bandaged up all over the place because they were rocking. They would, they, were, they would be moving like this as fast as they could. There were some women that could take, cut two fish at a time and flip them around uh, in, their, in one hand and put them into a can. That's an educated laugh over <laughs> there. Uh, and um, there were just, uh, there were some that kind of just plodded along. Uh, once those fish were picked up in these in these tray, in these racks and put into this uh, typical cart, and that was part of his his innovation, was that this cart full of the racks of sardines were wheeled into a steam box, and they were cooked first by steam, then they were removed once they were cooked, and those these carts were on. Um, uh, axles, uh, pivots, and they would they would take the cart and they would flip the cart upside down. And the racks would hold all the fish together, and all the water and all the steam would drip out, and they get dry. Once they were cool and they were dry, the carts would be wheeled over to a packing machine. I know there's some pictures of packing machines over there, and the racks would be dropped into a grid, and the, so the rack part would fall away, leaving just the cans. And the cans were marshaled two at a time into a line with little uh, guide, guide the rails. So it was like a really interesting Willy Wonka kind of an operation with cans and things moving around all over the place. And they'd go through this large carousel of a piece of equipment that would inject sauce into the can, throw a lid on it, and move it down the line until it found a way up into a two-story pressure cooker called a retort. Re retort. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, those of you that have heard anecdotal stories about the fire and the factory, inevitably those stories are accompanied with fines of cans 11 miles away and uh, stuff being found all over the coast of Maine. The fire was fierce and there was an explosion when those retorts went. It was like a pressure cooker and they blew. And cans were sent everywhere. And there were cans out in Mohegan Island, and there's cans uh, aplenty. Certainly, that was all around the factory. And to this day, you can still go to that spot and find melted aluminum and different, uh, different little hints of what once was on that spot. I moved along. Uh, that's why. So, that, so there, that, that's that. Um, and. Uh, so who are these lounging people here? So that's my grandfather. This uh, this here is uh, Sam's grandfather. These are his very stylish uh, sandals, European style sandals. Pauline Zwecker, my grandmother. Uh, this is my other grandmother, actually. They, they were first cousins. They explain a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Running on my laptop, running over there, so folks can take a look. Awesome. Thank you. So I heard the art community called, first of all, Perry Gut Learning Center was named for the original name for what is now Fort Clyde. We kept a really good name. <laughs> Uh, I'm very fortunate. Our next speaker on the stand is uh, speaking about the integration of the art community and the history of Portland. Thank you. 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 Thank
And my, my what I'm coming to realize <coughs> is, is in dealing with all the artists, that is uh, Sidney Marsh Chase painting in Fort Platt. And, I, and today, I was trying to determine where this is, and he's down, he's standing down there in the co-op, because there's a green church. Um, so, Sidney Marsh Chase and N.C. Wyatt came here together. They bought eight bells together. Chase was a one-quarter owner of the property, and N.C. Wyatt was, owned three-quarters of it. And they, they bought that house in 1920, and by 1930, 1931, Chase had signed over his portion of the house to N.C. Wyatt. And N.C. Wyatt then renovated it and uh, upgraded it for he and his five children. So interesting, um, there, I have access to some of Chase's journals. And he was writing about N.C. Wyatt. And, one of the things that I, I've really come to realize is because there was no artist colony here, the artists came here pretty much as individuals. So they really became part of the community of Fort Clyde. Whereas if you go to an artist colony like Ogunkwitz, the artists stay in the colony. They, their community is other artists. But these artists, to a person, were individuals. So they really became part of the community. So I'm going to write, uh, read a journal entry by um, Chase, and forgive my uh, interpretation of what a, a Maine fisherman sounds like. Remember, <laughs> I'm a first generation. <laughs> so this was from August 5th, 1939. N.C. Wyatt, Wyatt asked Captain Creighton S. Thompson what kind of a chair a captain's wife would sit in on deck for an illustration for the book Trending into Maine. Can you go to the... Oh, that's a, that is, sorry, that's a painting by Sidney Mark Chase, and can anyone recognize this building? Ice cream. Ice cream shop. No. no. Ocean House. Ocean House. It's a terrible, it's a terrible slide. Sorry. So that's by uh, Chase. And that's one. This is a, a, a painting by N.C. Wyatt, and this was painted um, from a house up on Glenmere. And you can see the lighthouse in the background. So the story goes, N.C. Wyatt asked Captain Creighton Thomas what kind of chair Captain wife would sit in. And that was for the book. The captain showed Wyatt one which he owned, and they had a long, interesting discussion about it. When the book came out, Wyatt sent him a proof of the picture. But the captain was disappointed, it seemed. Questioned by Mrs. Hucker about the difficulty, the captain said, finally, well, there won't much of the chair showed anyway, and what there was won't right. He's right. So you can see just a little bit, a little part of the chair. So my my accent was terrible. I got it. So. So um, and eventually, when uh, Chase uh, gave the house to or sold the house to Wyatt, he eventually moved to Martinsville, where he lived uh, summers for the rest of his life until 1957. So obviously, then N.C. Wyatt had a child named Andrew Wyatt. Everybody's very familiar with him. But what you may not know is how important Sid Chase was to the Wyatt family and to Andrew Wyatt in particular. And this is a letter that Andrew, a very short letter, that Andrew wrote to Sidney. This was from 1957, giving him full credit for his artistic vision. Dear Sidney, today as I walked over the hills above the Brandywine in the late afternoon, I kept thinking of you. The landscape always becomes simple as night came on, and it reminds me of the many times I have heard you say about keeping your design simple. As I looked across the valley with the long shadows creeping ever deeper and the late sun gleaming on a stone farmhouse, how true your fine words seemed and how exciting. Certainly, Sidney, your talks with me about painting are very real and great and mean more to me as time goes on. Whenever I complete a picture, I always say to myself, I wonder how Sid would like this. Have I told my story simple enough? So you see, you are with me a great deal of the time 
And along with this, you are very dear to me. I just had to write and tell you this. And so imagine the influence he had on a great artist like Andrew Wyatt. And so Andrew often wrote about the influences in his art for Sidney Marsh Chase and his father, N.C. Wyatt. Um, so, moving on quickly, how much time do I have? You got to have to have So, another, another well-known artist um, in, oh, this is a, an Andrew Wyatt painting of, um, it's called The Coming Storm, it's a painting of Teal Island. So, you know all the wives, they painted all around here, and NC could be seen walking Horse Point Road daily. So they were really part of the community. Um, and they didn't really isolate themselves. And there are many stories. People talk about knowing Andy, knowing NC. You didn't know NC, did you? I didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she did. My 98-year-old 90, grandmother knows them very well. Yeah. So that's, that's the whole point of this, is that they're part of the community. You know, they weren't separate. Uh, so, so William Thawne is another artist who um, came to Port Clyde in 1940 and bought his three acres in Port Clyde in 1946. This is an example of the uh, quarries in winter. And um, what's interesting about Thon is he's one of only several artists who lived in Port Clyde year-round. Most were summer residents, came for a few weeks, came for a summer. But he and um, Robert Hamilton, were the two who really lived here year-round, and me, of course. Um, but if you can tell me of more people who you know, I mean, I'm always interested in that. You know my time is very limited today. So um, this uh, William Thawne, William Thawne was internationally known in the 1960s and 70s. His reputation has fallen off these days. Um, and his, the value of his work has gone down, unfortunately, because uh, early on his dealer uh, passed away and he didn't have the New York representation any longer. But well known in this area. Very fine artist. And another great artist who moved to Port Clyde is uh, Kenneth Nolan. And you probably know about the Nolan Foundation, which is on uh, Drifton Road. Very active. And um, Nolan was uh, also internationally known as an abstract expressionist or field painter. And he was really uh, famous for being one of the founders of the uh, Washington School of Color. And so he lived here summers in Fort Clyde, and many people don't, don't even realize that it's just down the road. The foundation's still ongoing. Um, so the two things I want to impress upon you, I've already talked about the the community and how the artists were part of the community. And if there had been a, an art colony here, there probably wouldn't be that in, interconnection with the community. The other thing that I want you to leave with is the fact that Port Clyde really has an international reputation as an art, I wouldn't call it an art center, but a center for artists. And here's, here's a little story. I'm from Pittsburgh. Okay. <laughs> hey, who said that? Okay, so I'm from Pittsburgh, and uh, Sally and I, we, we uh, took a trip home, and I, I called through internet, you know, through Facebook. Oh, you know, let's get together. I, and I called together about three or four guys who I haven't seen literally in about 45 years. Right? So we go, we have a nice, we start to have lunch. And one of, one of the guys who I haven't seen since the mid-70s said, so where are you living? I know you're in Maine. I said, oh, we, we live in the mid-coast. Well, I know, but where? I, I know Maine a little bit. Where, where are you? I said, well, Rockland. That's close enough. I'm a little north of Portland. Okay, but, but where? Yeah. I said, well, no. I live in Port Clyde. You're kidding. <laughs> My father-in-law taught art in Port Clyde for decades. Frank Webb. Anybody? Can you go to Frank Webb? No. His father-in-law taught art in Port Clyde for decades. Taught classes, taught individuals. He married his daughter, and he visited here in Port Clyde from Pittsburgh. 
And so we had this automatic connection, and I, I connected with Frank Webb, and he has pictures of the general store and views that I, that I can identify, and ones like this of the lighthouse. And so what I want to impress upon you is, is Port Clyde is known as an art center. Port Clyde is known as a place to, to uh, teach art and make art, and it's, it's a wonderful legacy in the art field. Well, he's, well, okay. <laughs> well, this is a great segue because uh, we've been very fortunate to have the uh, support and um, uh, this past summer with Angela Anderson. And uh, last weekend we had a paint party on uh, a Saturday where we had the full house, and it was so popular that Angela, Angela said, "Oh, I'll, I'll do another paint party with that." Uh, so there's actually one scheduled for next Monday. Afternoon, I think three to five, and uh, we still have some spaces available. You too can be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> Beginning at the circle. Well, which leads us to our last segment of the presentation uh, program tonight, and that's the integration of commerce. Now we know, of course, about the fishing and the sardine factory and the packing industry here, right in Port Clyde. But there's much more to the story of uh, commerce and businesses here. Port Clyde. And Larry Anderson has said he'd be willing to share a few uh, thoughts and uh, stories. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, Larry is a long-time uh, you know, resident and uh, visitor here to Maine. And uh, let me just sort of ask, start the question, and you can go from there. I know that in chatting with your daughter and your, uh, and you, you, you've had a a lengthy international business experience all around the world, and I, and I asked this politely, uh, how, did a, how did a young man from Port Clyde end up being an international businessman? Well, okay, a lot of stuff weaves together with that. <laughs> First of all, my father was the manager of Port Clyde Packing Company. And when I was growing up, my father put me through all the different functions. So everything Rick was describing, I've done all of them. <laughs> Whether it was even my grandfather, Fort Davis, we caught the herring in the Seine, starting there. And my dad had me down there bringing fish up into the tanks, and I worked with the retorts and all of that stuff. Well, what I really enjoyed in the wintertime when the factory wasn't working, I'd get out of the office, it was up above, and I'd sit at Dad's desk just knowing I wanted to do business. That's what I wanted to do. But as, as it would be, uh, my father and mother thought I should go be a teacher. So they sent me to the University of Maine at Farmington, but after two years, I quit that. And a dear friend of the family, Saul Zemecker, I had said to Saul, he was headed back to New York, I said, Saul, this Citizen Band radio is really fun. You should pick up one while you're in New York. So Saul comes back, and he brought two radios back. And he said, Larry, what I'm going to do is sell one to pay for mine. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty shortly thereafter, he says, I think there's a business here. <laughs> He invited me to start a business. In September 1963, we started in the tenement house just this side of the Baptist church. We were downstairs there. Wow, the thing took off. We went up to Rockland and we, there was an A-frame outside of Grossman's, which now is E.L. Spear. And we put what we called amateur equipment sales in there. And then, so successful, we bought a building down on Main Street in Rockland, which is now the Puppin's Nest, and we became a Lafayette Associate store. Many people know about Lafayette, most New York as well. It isn't around right now. But we had a very successful, successful business for about 13 years in Rockland, and then in my mid-30s, I was looking for yet more in the business side, and uh, Raytheon hired me to for the Marine Division, and then through Raytheon, I was fortunate enough to be promoted to various levels of management, 
ending up my last stint with Raytheon, was managing a, a subsidiary in Europe and the Middle East from Copenhagen, Denmark. So that's wow. when you talk international, it kind of went that way. And the last piece was uh, National Marine Electronics. I mean, Jerry talked about me ruining the business. But <laughs> <laughs> National Marine Electronics Association also asked me uh, if I could help them develop a new network for the boats, for marine electronics and engines. So some of you might recognize NMEA 2000. That's a standard that electronically connects everything on the boat. Well, I happen to be fortunate enough to lead the effort of developing that. And uh, I did that for quite a few years, and it's a very successful standard, and they're still building on it today. So, Mr. Anderson, with your uh, growing up in Port Clyde and you know, the, the son of the plant manager, what yeah. other businesses were there in Port Clyde that were you know, thriving at the same time as the sardine factory? Well, certainly the grocery stores. You not only had the general store right across from our house. By the way, I've got the old family house I grew up in. When Mom passed away, we kept it, and we love it. And I can't wait to get back here every year and be here. And uh, sorry, oh, you got it. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the right across diagonally, where now they park cars, the Manhigan boat right there. There was a store called Hucker's Store. It was about three levels high, a big store there. That was booming. The general store, which was Ralph Simmons at that time, that was booming. Morris. Morris store. Morris had a store too. Well, and we had a store that had Olson had a store up there in his house, which is the house Jerry now, where you guys are renting out. Next door to that was Ingersoll, between where your house is and Cal Schwab. There was a building there where we used to catch a school bus from to go over to Tennis Harbor to go to school. So you had all these kind of booming uh, little stores and businesses going on yeah. down there. And a lot of different fisheries, like Jerry was saying, like the dragging. I mean, cold storage. Down where you guys have your boats and it's so lovely down there now, cold storage was just booming with buying fish and offloading fish and. Uh, just a lovely place. And my memories are phenomenal about all that. There was boat building right there too. Right, right. Uh, as you get out to Cold Storage right along now, which was Spinner Cushman's fish shop, and, and along that area there was a large building. My grandfather built the Fanny H, the boat we, we had when I was growing up, and he built the Marie H, which was Levi Huffer's boat. So, and Ralph Simmons built the boat, the San Rafael was built there. And that was all right there along the road just across from the house. And uh, so there was a lot of commercial activity going on. So when, when the uh, factory unfortunately burned to the ground, yeah, uh, literally to the ground, um, how did that impact the town as far as the stores? And, uh, uh, I'm not really qualified to answer that specific question. By then, in the 70s, I had left. Yeah. And uh, I remember when the factory burned down, because Saul and I still had the business at the time. I mean, it was very dramatic, obviously, and yeah. problematic, and uh, really devastating, that whole thing. So for me, it was more of a personal devastation uh, right. to lose all of that. And, uh, but still, these days, when I walk up around Factory Road to walk up to the lighthouse and look down, it's just the memory floods. So, what's going on? so one of the things that Heron got actually plays now is to, uh, this program is just one example, is that we like to tell the story, keep the stories of what Port Clyde was in the past with sharing it with the generations to come so that people understand that sort of storyline of where we came from here on the peninsula and where we're going with the diverse populations and tourism and, right. and how, you know, tourist housing and things like that now. Mr. Anderson, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Visitors 
is definitely something that we want to consider. And the history of Fort Clyde would be one thing that we would want to look for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was so boring 
so broad just to haul trap after trap. I had visions of George's bands in the east coast of the United States, up and down along the shelf. And I spent a number of my years running scholar boats out of New Bedford, Massachusetts, all over George's banks, up from the Canadian border all the way down to the Chesapeake. And, uh, but those days, I owned boats. I don't know how many boats I've owned. Uh, hearing singing was my addiction. When I was 18 years old, you had a picture of the Neary on there. I went two years with Don Wilson over the near. Uh, just for your information, the Delta had held 2,000 bushels. 2,000. Yep, and the near held 1,400. And we would load that near it with hearing. And, and if we had any chop at all, man, that, the, <laughs> the seas would they'd come down across the bow of her, hit that big scale box in the middle of the deck, and you'd think it was going to take it right out. But uh, that was that Dawn Wilson, Dawn's father, uh, ran the Neary for years. And uh, I remember down in what we call the Lazarette, down the stern of the boat. I was pouring around one day. We were anchored up, waiting for the saners to come. And, uh, and I got looked and I found a stool in, in the Lazarette. And I said, oh, all that time sitting around, I'm going to get that stool up. And I got that stool out, and boy, it wasn't out very long, but Dawn had that stool and had it right back, and I said, we don't use that stool. You can stand up. <laughs> <laughs> As a young fella, and, and 18 years old, 19 years old, and, uh, we usually had, we'd usually be done on Friday, Friday night, and have Saturday off, and then Sunday we'd be running off to get hearing from one of the singers that had stopped singing. I mean, early on, Rick Wright, the wares, we had wares over here in Gaze Island, Crow Morris had one there, uh, wares at Caldwell Island, uh, Old Man Coleman had one there, Coley, in uh, different places. But they found it more lucrative to take the dories with the stop singing and we would go and find, my grandfather had a little, it wasn't his skiff, a fellow went with him, Morris Thompson, Block Thompson, and he fished with my grandfather for 40 years, and he had this nice little rope. Thing would grow so easy. And I can remember night after night that my grandfather would take his flashlight, and he'd go get in that boat, and he'd take some rags, and he'd put them in the oil locks, and put the oil sock, in the oil sockets and put the oil locks in and he had a board that would sit just across it and he'd sit on there and he'd get in that and he'd start to roll. <coughs> and we might be over to Moss's Island uh, or, or one of the, any one of the places and I know nights that he would start rowing at six or seven o'clock in the evening and you might not see him till four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. He'd roll all night. And he'd go and he'd listen for flips. And then he'd look for if the water was firing, he'd see them in the fire. But many times, if you wanted to know how thick they were, he'd have a long six, five or six cell flashlight. And he wouldn't flash it around. He'd just put it out over the side of the boat and turn it on just briefly. And he could see how thick the hair was. You could see that down in the water. And uh, my grandfather was a good fisherman. Like uh, Larry said, he had a boat, the Fanny H. They built uh, Axel Brunros, who ran Rockland Boat Shop in Rockland. Uh, had the moles, had the know-how, and any time they got in trouble, they would go up to Axel Brunros and hit them down and help them out. But uh, there was a, there was so much history. I happened to be when uh, my weekends, some of my weekends. I wanted to go singing so bad. I wanted to have a singer of my own so bad that I would take my weekends and I would go down to Botanicus and I would go for nothing with Victor Raines. Jerry's father was there. Jerry's uncle was there, John Crane. And he had a boat called the Hilda and Helen. And Victor was one of the best. And I would just stand there in the wheelhouse and watch him and learn how he'd set with the tide, 
watch the scanner, watch how he'd approach the fish and how they'd set the scene. Until one day when I was 21 years old, uh, my grandfather being a singer, he had sold hearing to all the factories. At one time there were 44 factories on the coast of Maine. Not one today. Okay? But my grandfather, I, said, I went down and I said, Grant, I said, there's a boat up, Holmes Packing Company in Morocco. I said, and uh, they ain't got no skipper for it. I said, it's the way you got it. He says, you think you'd like to try that? I said, yes, I would. So we went to Holmes Packing Company, owned by Mose and Alger Pipe from down at Eastport. They had a plant down there as well. And uh, we went in, and the fellow that was the general manager of the plant there in Rockland, his name was Kermit St. Peter. And we went in, and uh, my grandfather says, uh, hey Kermit, he says, this is my grandson. He says, I understand you've got a singer up here and no one to take him. And, uh, he says, yes, we do, Ford. He says, uh, this your grandson? He, he says, you think he's capable? And Grant says, well, if I didn't think he wasn't, I, I wouldn't have brought him. He says, yes, I think he's capable. And so I got that boat on the spot. Uh, I remember I had it for two years before I bought my own boat. But the day the sardine factory burned, I was in Southwest Harbor and we were fishing Mount Desert Rock. And the singers, the carriers, would run the hearing back to Fort Clyde or to Rockland or wherever. But we would go in and lay in Southwest Harbor. And we were coming out just in the afternoon, late afternoon. And I got, we got news over the radio that the factory was on fire. And I don't know, Southwest Harbor, by, as the gull flies, uh, 60, 70 miles away, 70 miles away maybe. And the smoke was just, you could see the billow of smoke up over the sky. The day the factory Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. But we have to yeah. Thank you.